I wanted to present some examples, some important examples of ring homomorphisms. Uh, one of the most classic ones is going to be a homomorphism from the ring of integers to the ring of integers mod n, right? And this, the, the homomorphism is actually similar to what we did when we considered cyclic groups previously in this lecture series. I can take any integer m and just map it to that same integer, but then reduce it mod n. This is in fact going to be a ring homomorphism. This is pretty easy to see here that if I have two numbers, m plus m prime, if you take phi of that, this just becomes m plus m prime mod n, like so, which of course this is the same thing as m uh, mod n plus m prime mod n, like so, in which case then you get phi of m plus phi of n, m prime, excuse me. And this is a property we proved about modular arithmetic at the very beginning of this lecture series. A similar statement can also be used to show that uh, multiplication is preserved here. So phi of m times m prime, right? This then becomes m m prime mod n. But then again, this is the, the, the properties with modular arithmetic, it preserves these things. This is the same thing as m mod n times m prime mod n which then gives you phi of m and phi of m prime, like so. So again, these are, these are all properties of modular arithmetic we've proven previously, so I'll just erase them from the screen. This is sort of the canonical uh, ring homomorphism from the integers to z mod n. And n is somewhat irrelevant in this situation. We can map z to any, to any modulus we want to. Um, in fact, we can generalize this example right here, that if s is any ring with unity, right? If S is any ring with unity, then we can actually construct a ring homomorphism from the integers to S via the following rule here, that the integer M will map to M times the unity of S. So what this, of course, means is we're taking the sum of IS and we do this um, M times. That, that, that's what it means. So this, this really is just 1 plus 1 plus 1, and we do this M times. That's how, that's how we should interpret that little symbol there. Why is this a ring homomorphism? Well, it's basically the same argument that we did before. And again, I do want you to see this as a generalization of this previous observation that you're just mapping m to m times one mod n. That's all you're doing there. Because m, when you're working zn, just means one plus one plus one plus one plus one m times, you just reduce it mod n. So that's what we're doing right here as well. So let's consider why is phi with this rule a ring homomorphism, we consider addition, right? Um, so you take phi of m plus n, you're gonna get m plus n is, for which the distributive property applies in this situation, uh, for which we get m1 plus n1, but that's just phi of m plus phi of n. So this is an additive homomorphism. What about multiplication? Well, in terms of multiplication here, you're going to get that this is mn times 1, which of course 1 has the nice property is that it's eigenpotent. 1 times 1 is equal to 1. Um, and then working through this, this becomes m1 plus n1. Now, again, I should even be more careful because after all, what are we doing here? This means 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus, you know, all the way down. Uh, there's a bunch of 1s here. And so we're getting m n many ones. Here we have m many ones, and here we have n many ones. If you foil that thing out using the distributed property, you end up with all these ones. You, I mean, you get a bunch of one times ones, so the eigenpotent statement is necessary. Uh, but I, what I'm trying to point out here is that this multiplication with integers is not necessarily the, the ring multiplication. It's more like a scalar multiplication is how we should be interpreting it here. Uh, because when we talk about, you know, if you talk about three times X in a ring, we don't mean you're timesing three by X using the multiplication of the ring. What we mean is you have X plus X plus X. You add it together three times. Um, this makes sense for any ring. That is, with any, with any ring, you can scale by an integer. Um, if it's a negative integer, of course, you interpret that to be the additive inverse. Of course, uh, but nonetheless, this makes sense uh, for any arbitrary ring. We have this idea of scalar multiplication by an integer, and this preserves, right? And because we can do this scalar multiplication for any ring, basically, we have this universal uh, ring homomorphism from the integers into 
an arbitrary ring with unity. So basically, as long as the ring has unity, in some respect, it has something that looks like the integers. Um, for which, if this map is one to one, this would suggest that S has a subring um, isomorphic to the integers. Now, of course, it could also be that this ring um, maybe it doesn't have a subgroup, a subring isomorphic to integers, but it might, it will have a sub ring isomorphic to Zn, where it could be the case that 1 plus 1 plus 1 all the way down to 1. It could This could be that there's some combination of adding 1s together that gives you 0. And if n is the smallest number of 1s that add up to be 0, we call this the characteristic of the ring. So uh, the characteristic of S would be n in that situation. It's the smallest number of ones that add up to be zero. If there's no number of ones that add up to be zero, we actually call it a characteristic zero ring. And that's mostly because the integers themselves are isomorphic to Z zero, because Z zero, well, Z in in general is Z mod Z n, uh, excuse me, N Z, that's what I meant to say. But if you have a zero there, then you, you don't use you kill off the identity, which doesn't do anything, that's just the identity. Right, so we can identify z with z sub zero, and so the characteristic is then this modulus of this z mod n, z mod zero being zero right there. And so, in general, the kernel of this map from z to s here is going to be um, some number times z, and that number n is the so called characteristic of the ring, it's the smallest number that makes adding ones together go to zero. But of course, if one goes to zero and you add up one, that happens for every element of the ring. So let's say I have some element of the ring x, and you do it n times, n times, this then becomes n times x, which is the same thing as n. Um, one times your identity, call it R right here, multiplicative identity, for which if you add together one n times, that becomes zero, and anything times zero is equal to zero. So if the identity, if, if the unity, I should say, adds up to, to zero in, uh, when you add it together n times, then every element will have that property as well. Hence, the characteristics a very important invariant of a ring. And so as you map the integers into a ring, um, this will happen in such a way that, oh, just map the one, the integer one to the unity of that ring. That's why we call unities one, because it in some regard behaves just like the integers. And the kernel then would do, have to do with the characteristic of the ring. And let's look at another example. Um, this time let R be a ring and let X be any set under the sun. Um, X doesn't have to have any algebraic structure. It does not have to be a ring. It does not have to be a group. It does not have to be a semi-group. It doesn't have to be anything. It's just a set. Um, then, we're going to build a ring. Now, that ring is not going to be on X. We're going to take R to the X, which remember, R to the X is the set of all functions of the form F maps X to R. So the superscript here is the domain, and then the base, we're using this exponential notation, is the codomain. So R to the X is the set of all functions that map from X to R. Now, we can give R to the X a ring structure. We do that by doing component-wise addition and multiplication. So we can add together functions. So if we have two functions, F and G, that belong to R to the X, uh, we define addition of the functions, F plus G by the rule, that if you evaluate at X, we define this to be F of X plus G of X. Uh, we can also do the same thing with multiplication. How do you define f times g? Well, to define a function, you just have to tell me what does it do to each element. So if you allow x to be an arbitrary element, we define f times g evaluated x to be f of x times g of x. Now notice f of x and g of x both belong to r. They're in the ring r. So since r is a ring, we can add together f of x and g of x. And so then we define the sum of the functions using that observation. And again, f of x and g of x belong to R, so their product belongs to R because it's a ring. So f times g is defined to be the function that always maps x to the product of f of x and g of x. So if the codomain is a ring, we can then define a ring structure on the functions. The, the, that is a set of functions, I should say. And it'll inherit all the nice ring properties. Addition, multiplication will be associative. Uh, addition will be commutative. 
we will have a zero element, right? Uh, for R of X here, the zero element will be the zero function, which is the constant function sends every element to zero. Um, if if R has a unity, um, R to the X will also have a unity, which will be the constant function that F of X is always equal to one. Uh, you'd get something like that. And the distributed property works because basically you're just piggybacking on the properties that R has. If R is a commutative ring, then R to the X will be a commutative ring as well. So we can build um, a ring structure using just functions and co component wise uh, operations. Now with this function, with this ring in mind, R to the X, it's now a ring. We can actually define a ring homomorphism from R to the X to R, where, you know, the R to the X, these are these R valued functions. And therefore we can actually evaluate the functions. And this makes a ring homomorphism. We actually call this the evaluation map. So for a fixed element X, we define a homomorphism phi sub X, where we send an, we send a function f to its evaluation f of x, like so. This will define a ring homomorphism. We can prove that it's closed under, a, a, uh, excuse me, that it's, uh, it preserves addition and multiplication, right? Let's see that really quickly. If I have two functions, phi sub x, you have f plus g right here. This maps it to f plus g of x. But by definition, f plus g of x is equal to f of x plus g of x, like so, um, which f of x is then phi sub x of f, and then g of x is phi sub x of g, right? So we actually defined addition of functions exactly to be what it must be for this function, this evaluation function, to be additively homomorphic. And the same is also true for multiplication here. If I take phi sub x of f times g, this will map to phi times g evaluated x, but by definition, what does f times g means? It means this is the function that maps x to f of x times g of x, for which individually f of x is phi sub x of f, and then individually g of x is going to be phi sub x of g, like so. And so again, the operations of addition and multiplication on r to the x are exactly the operations that they need to be to make the evaluation map be homomorphic. And this is something we do in algebra a lot. We can build we can build an algebra. In this case, we can build a ring so that what we really care about is maybe not the ring itself, but we care about the homomorphism. We built a ring exactly so that evaluation is now a homomorphism in this setting. A very important special case of this is if we take the polynomial ring, r to the x, um, and map it to r. We can also do this by evaluation. Um, and so we can evaluate we can evaluate each of the x's with a specific value, call it t or whatever. Uh, this is this is by analog going to be the case as well. All right, one last example that's really important we talk about is the endomorphism ring. Um, this is going to be very similar to the r to the x we saw a moment ago, uh, but not exactly. So uh, there, there's a slight slight change here. So let's 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 explain that. Um, so we're going to take R to be a ring, and we're going to take functions from R to R. So it's kind of like what we did a moment ago with the uh, with R to the X, but now the the set X is R itself. Uh, an endomorphism on R is a ring homomorphism of the form R to R. So this is a ring homomorphism from R back into itself. All right, so. Unlike the previous example, we had R to the X, where X didn't necessarily have any algebraic structure, and then the functions we were considering had no algebraic structure whatsoever. Things are a little bit different now. Now we're talking about R to the R, where the domain has an algebraic structure, and now we want the maps from, in this situation, from R to R, we want these to be homomorphisms, ring homomorphisms. That's a very important difference here. There is algebraic structure on these functions now. And because of that, we're going to change what multiplication means in this situation. Um, instead of writing R to the R, because if we wrote that, this would actually imply we we're talking about the function uh, ring we had done on the previous slide. And so we use a different notation. We're going to use end of R, so the endomorphism ring on R. Uh, it'll, it'll, this will actually be a ring with unity. The unity is guaranteed this time. With R to the X, it had a unity only if R had a unity. But even if R doesn't have unity, 
the endomorphism ring will have unity. Um, and that's because we change what multiplication means. Addition is going to be exactly what it was a moment ago. Uh, we define addition as just the usual function addition. So f plus g evaluated at x is still going to be f of x plus g of x. That part's the same. So as a, if you just look at the additive structure, in the endomorphism ring R and R to the R, the, the function ring has exactly the same structure. And with, re with regard to multiplication though, multiplication is gonna be defined to be function composition. So if you take F times G, this is equal to F composed with G, all right? Uh, and so therefore, if we take F times G evaluated at X, this actually means F of g of x in the usual function composition sense. Uh, because these are endomorphisms, the domain and the codomain are exactly the same. So if I take any two endomorphisms, I can always compose them together. Uh, this will give us a non-commutative ring. Um, r, to the, r to the x is commutative if r is commutative. Even if r is commutative here, then the, it doesn't matter. The endomorphism ring will be non-commutative because uh, function composition they, they just don't commute. It does have an identity. The identity element is going to be the identity function uh, in the usual sense. Um, and in fact, when you look at this definition, we don't even need R to be a ring. We can actually get away with R being an abelian group. If R is just an abelian group, then the same definition would apply. We can actually build a ring um, using an abelian group, although oftentimes we start off with a ring, and that's why I defined it the way I did. And so these are some very important examples of these are some very important examples of rings that we actually can construct using homomorphisms. The last thing, of course, I want to mention is if you look at the group of units, given any ring, right? If we look at those rings which have units that are multiplically invertible, the group of units here um, is going to be the automorphism group of R, which remember an automorphism is a isomorphism from R back into itself, for which, of course, we define ring homomorphisms. What's a ring isomorphism? It's going to be a bijective ring homomorphism. And so those endomorphisms, which are invertible, exactly are the bijective endomorphisms. These are the automorphisms. This would be the group of units of the ring. And so, so this, this the study of the endomorphism ring is a very, very important topic in ring theory, which we might see sometime in the future.